There's a series of suttas in the canon where monks are out in the forest meditating. But letting their minds wander in different places, doing things they shouldn't be doing, thinking about things they shouldn't be thinking about. And Dave has come and called them on it. Probably the most famous one is the one of the monk who is going bathing. And there's a lotus in the lake of water where he's going to go bathe. So he bends over and sniffs the lotus. And Dave up here suddenly says, you just stole the scent of that lotus. And the monk basically says, oh, come on. That's not theft. And she says, look, anyone who's really serious has to see even the slightest fault as big as a cloud. You think back in those days, clouds were the biggest things you saw. The sky is big. But clouds can cover the whole sky and more. They're bigger than the sky. So the monk comes to his senses, thanks her for warning him, and then says, From now on, if you see me do anything like that, could you warn me again? And she says, No, I'm not your servant. You look after yourself. She leaves. And as the sutta says, the monk was struck with sun wake up. This happens in every case. The monk is struck with sangwega. That's when his practice gets serious. The word is a hard one to translate. Sometimes it's translated as urgency, and urgency is the result of sangwega. The word itself is related to a word for terror, dismay. That's what the animals of the forest feel when the lion comes out and roars his roar, realizing that they're in danger. And that's the point in their practice when you start taking things seriously. You can't just coast along. We're not here to simply accept what's going on and be okay with it and think that's going to be enough. We have to see that there's a, a big problem. We're going after things that are subject to aging, illness, and death. And we're going to be suffering aging, illness, and death, and the suffering that goes along with that. As long as we go after these things, we have this thirst for them. When we begin to realize, okay, we're the ones causing the trouble. And if we don't put our act together, nobody else is going to do it for us. Otherwise, this huge expanse of suffering lies before us. The Buddha talks about how he developed a sense of sangwega before he ordained. He saw the world as being like a river drying up, and there are fish flapping over one another, trying to beat one another out to get that last little bit of water. And of course, no matter who wins, they're all going to die. He looked around and he saw that every place where he might want to look for happiness had already been laid claim to. If he was going to find happiness in this world, he was going to have to fight other people off. And then, like the fish, every bird was going to die. That, he said, with his feeling of sangwega. But then he realized okay, the problem lay in the heart. And there was an arrow in the heart, he said, if you could remove the arrow. then you'd be free. So this is what we're doing as we practice. We're trying to remove the arrow in our heart. As Buddha said, you think about death as much as you can to remind yourself that this is serious business. And if the work isn't being done now, when is it going to get done? There's one sutta where he says, every time the sun sets, you should remind yourself, you can die tonight. Death is easy. It can happen so easily. A little bit of hardened blood starts wandering around in your blood system, gets lodged in your heart, gets lodged in your brain, and you're out. You can trip and fall, hit your head at the wrong way. I mean, it's so easy. Are you ready to go? 
And you have to look at your mind. What in there would create trouble for you if you had to go right now? What would you be holding on to? This is one of the reasons why the Buddha is so strongly against the principle of clinging. All the things we cling to as being right and being ours and whatever, those are the things that are going to pull us down if we suddenly have to go. So what sort of things are you holding on to that you shouldn't be holding on to? Well, let go of them right now. Same when the sun rises. You can remind yourself, it's maybe a pretty sunrise, but you could go today. Are you ready to go? What's in the mind that's not ready to go? You've got to deal with that. And as the Buddha says, when you find anything unskillful in the mind, you have to treat it in the same way that a person whose head is on fire or trying to put out the fire. You're not just aware of the flames and accepting the flames. He says you have to be mindful, relentless, ardent in putting out those flames. The mindfulness here means that you, you keep your mind focused on what's really important right now. Which is basically letting go of unskillful qualities. And the acceptance here would be that, okay, you accept that they're there, but you don't let them stay there. The Buddha gives different techniques for getting rid of unskillful qualities. The first is if you know that your mind is wandered off into something that's unskillful, you just replace it with something more skillful. Like when you're focused on the breath and suddenly find yourself thinking about memories of the past. Problems in the monastery, problems in the world outside. Those aren't the issue right now. The issue right now is what's going on in your mind. So you come back to the breath. And then you work with the breath in a way that makes it more interesting so it's not so easy to slip off. But if you find yourself slipping back again and again, then you really have to think about the drawbacks of that kind of thinking. Where is it going to take you? If you thought about that kind of thing for 24 hours, what would it induce you to do? Usually a lot of unskillful things. Is it worth it? If there are thoughts of sensuality, remind yourself of the different analogies the Buddha gives for sensuality. There's no nourishment there, a lot of danger. If thinking of the drawbacks isn't enough, then the Buddha says, ignore the thought. In other words, it can be one part of the mind, but you stay focused on the breath. Because in cases like that, simply the fact that you pay attention to it is going to be feeding it. So starve it of attention. Like a dog that keeps coming around to the house, hoping for some food for you. You know if you give it food, then it's going to hang around, and you don't want the dog hanging around. You just don't feed it. And eventually it'll go away. If that doesn't work, then the Buddha says, relax around the thought. This step is useful when you have some sense of the breath energy in the body. And you begin to notice that when a particular thought comes up, there'll be a catch in the energy someplace. It might be in the arm, it might be in the hands, in the head. It can be anywhere in the body. Once you notice that the thought is related to a particular tightness or tension in some part of the body, relax that tension. If none of these techniques work, then he says, Press your tongue against the roof of your mouth, grit your teeth, and just tell yourself, I'm not going to think that thought. Beat your mind down, he says, with your mind. This is where a meditation word is really useful. Well, like Bhutto, I just do it really rapid fire. So we're not here to accept our unskillful thoughts beyond the simple acceptance. Okay, they're there. You've got to do something about them. Because it could really get in the way if you go. As the Buddha saw in the night of his awakening, the kind of karma that determines your next lifetime is a combination of things you've done throughout this lifetime, plus your state of mind, and especially your views at death. 
And you want to make sure that nothing else comes in to get in the way of right view at that point. So you really have to have some good control of your mind. And if you can't control it now while you're healthy, how can you control it when the body's really weak? That's a lot of pain. And you realize you've got to leave. So there's work to be done. And Sung Wig is there to remind you that it's urgent. You can't be complacent. So there in the back of the mind is the fact. Okay, you could die at any time. It's not the main focus, though. When the Buddha describes mindfulness of death, it's always in the background. The foreground is what needs to be done right now. Then if you're doing something unskillful, how can you change what you're doing? How can you have a change of heart to make yourself realize it's important not to let yourself indulge in thoughts of sensuality, thoughts of anger, thoughts of ill will? So if you can stir up that sense of sangwig, it can really have an impact. It can have bring about a change of heart, which is what's needed. We all know the Buddhist teachings on karma. I've been repeating them many, many times. You've heard them many times. There has to come a point, though, where you begin to realize, okay, it hits home. The Buddha is really serious. This is, this is not a picnic. When the body dies, it plays hardball. So you have to have your skills ready. So you're not taken in by pain, you're not taken in by any of the aggregates. When you have that sense of urgency, that's when your practice really takes off. <laughs>